Hello, and welcome to another Mixing Monday. I am Glenn Kessler here at the lovely Compass Atelier in Rockville, Maryland, just north of Washington, D.C. And we have a very special uh, Mixing Monday today, a little different than our normal protocols where I've been mixing up colors. Today, we're gonna actually stop and look at our entire palette of colors. I'll explain the 11 colors that I use and recommend uh, for use with the Painter's Compass color wheel, and I'll also explain why I use those 11 colors and why you might uh, want to look into them as well. Uh, if you are joining us live, thank you for coming. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with your network, it should be down at the bottom. You can uh, go ahead and share this broadcast, let people know that they can come and join us in live time and ask questions and share in the community. Uh, you can also in the comments down below uh, say hello or later ask a question. If you have any questions at all about maybe a color that's on your palette or why I have a color on mine, uh, that's part of the beauty of catching these videos live at 3.30 every Monday. So um, we'll be going, and that's Eastern time, by the way. I know we have a lot of folks joining us from other time zones now. I've uh, been very thrilled with the um, responses so far. Thank you guys for tuning in, for sharing with your networks, and for talking up what we're doing here. We are starting to really affect uh, people's palettes and, and people's confidence as painters, uh, even just a month and a half now into the, this um, experience of doing the Mixing Monday. So I so appreciate you guys joining and uh, you know see a lot of the same names joining us week to week, which is fantastic. And uh, this is only gonna help you guys, I think, feel more confident about color mixing in your own studio practice. Uh, and of course, please uh, continue to share what we're doing with others who might benefit from it so that they can take advantage as well. Uh, the more the merrier. So let me um, uh, say hello to a few folks. Uh, if you're catching us on video after, feel free to fast forward for about two minutes as we just wait for everyone who wants to join us uh, to join, say some hellos. So just go ahead and fast forward two minutes. Otherwise, if you're, um, if you're joining us live at 3.30 p.m., uh, let me say hello to you. So hello, John MacArthur, welcome. Uh, Paula, great to see you as well. And uh, Pat Coates, hi. Jacob, of course, joining us again. Thanks, Jacob. And Matt, great to have you back again, Matt. Uh, Marilyn, you've been waiting for this. Well, I can't wait to, uh, to share with you why we make some of the choices we make with the palette. It's gonna be a great day. Debbie Cohen, Jan Pretty. Oh, Jan, great to, great to hear from you again. Hope all's well. And your lovely pet portraits. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Betsy, uh, it's, uh, that's a new name, wonderful to see. Uh, Freddie Wiener and, and Donna Taylor, great. Who else have we got here? Regina, been curious about this for a while. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, I hope we'll make a case for these colors. And these are not the only colors one can use. Uh, I'll, I'll make a case for my 11, uh, and then you know, happy to work with you guys on anything you like, uh, uh, kind of exploring this issue of why we would choose the palette we would choose. Uh, Kelsey, yes, absolutely. Did you receive yours already, Kel? Uh, I, I know I just sent it out a couple of days ago, so hopefully the USPS is getting these color wheels out to you uh, as quickly as, uh, as, as they can. Sally, hello. Uh, hi, Shanali. Uh, you missed the last two. No worries, if you miss these videos, they are always going to be immediately uploaded after we end. We usually end around four o'clock, uh, sometime sooner if I can but uh, we've got a lot of content to share. And they'll immediately go up onto the Painter's Compass Color Wheel Facebook page. So if you have found this video through a different page, great, I have shared it across a lot of my different pages, but that one page, the Painter's Compass Color Wheel is the place, <coughs> excuse me, of origin for these videos. So that's where you would find the extra videos uh, and you can just scroll through all of them. Hello, Margo. Hello again, Nan. Nan just exited class uh, with me. We've been running class all morning. Rona, Ed again, absolutely. Margo, welcome back. <laughs> uh, Cynthia, very good. Yeah, all of my morning students are here. Um, thanks, Jan, glad, glad to have you. And is it Alka, Alka Kana, welcome. Uh, Barbara Bailey, great, glad you're catching up on those videos. And uh, Debbie Sullivan, okay. Um, I think we are gonna go ahead and get, uh, and get things rolling here. Let me flip you guys around and we will check out our palette. Uh, so the main thing, 
main thing for today that we're going to be covering is the layout of our colors, why we choose the colors that we choose, and how this might be of benefit uh, to you. So let's start from the top. Uh, the Painter's Compass color wheel operates uh, in, in this way. When you receive your Painter's Compass color wheel, it will be inside of a plastic bag. Do not throw away the bag. The bag is very important. You'll actually receive it. It'll have this, uh, this cover sheet uh, on top inside the bag. You can put this one aside, although I do like to keep it. It, it brings you to the resources tab where you can find videos and other information about the Painter's Compass color wheel. You can, of course, go to the painterscompass.com or just painterscompass.com. But you'll want to open up the bag and take out the laminated color wheel. You'll combine this with your wet erase marker, which uh, you can either purchase from us in the bundle pack or you can pick up at uh, maybe the local Staples or Office Depot. Uh, not typically an art supply store uh, product, but uh, you, you might get lucky and you do want it to be a wet erase, not a dry erase. Uh, this uh, is now when you would indicate your pigments, your palette of colors. You would, you would draw this directly on the wheel. And I've put my 11 colors on here in shorthand. If you are using these 11 colors, then this is exactly where they would go. And, um, and, and you know, depending on if you buy a different brand or a different pigment, you would place your pigments in different spots. Uh, initially, you might need the little code. I'm going to leave those on here for you, but eventually you, you might not need those code. Um, we're writing this in a wet erase marker so that when we, when we put it down, it's non-erasable just with pressure. To erase it, you would need to engage water. You would need to use some water with it uh, to take that off, which is fine if you end up ever changing colors. If you decide uh, you're no longer interested in cadmium orange, uh, you might want to move to cadmium orange deep, and I'm actually thinking about that right now now, um, that, uh, that you would simply erase it. You get a little paper towel uh, and just dip it in some water. Don't need a lot. And you would just wipe that. Again, dry is not going to take anything off, but wet pulls it right off. And so there we go. Now you're ready. And you can add your new color if you added, you know, cadmium orange deep and then you would put that code down cod maybe you would say or if you added a cadmium red light then you could put crl up through there and that would set in about a minute that'll be dry and you could set that and then you would slip it back inside of the sheep uh, inside of the plastic bag and it's on top of the bag that we actually do most of our work and then again if you ever need to change your colors you decide that cadmium red light and that cadmium orange deep were not to your liking and you want to go back to our cadmium orange here then you can just add it right back back inside of the bag and now we're ready to go All right, so that's how, we, that's how we set everything up. And now it's about mixing and mixing is drawing on the wheel. And you know we've, we've covered that in other lectures and feel free to go back and grab those. Today is gonna to be a lot about exploring these, uh, these paints. And for those who don't know, let me run through them real quick. Um, first of all, I love Gamblin uh, oil colors, artist oil colors, and this is my strongest recommendation. They provide incredibly high quality products. Uh, and consistent, and of course, American-made, which is always nice uh, as well. Uh, got got uh, great things to say about Gamblin, and that, that's been going for years since before I was, uh, I was named a, a Gamblin uh, professional workshop uh, or dedicated workshop artist, uh, which helps them to, you know, support my students and, and, you know, we can get some mediums and some test colors to try out and stuff like that. But again, that came after, uh, you know, it's a great company. So our first color is Alizarin Permanent or Alizarin Crimson. I really like both of them. I'm currently working with the Permanent, which is a mixed color. Uh, made from pigment red 177 and pigment green 36, uh, which creates a more permanent alternative to original alizarin crimson. Normally I prefer uh, single pigment tubes, but this is one of those exceptions where I just really love that color. Cadmium red medium uh, is my next. Cadmium red 
Uh, if it doesn't say medium, most brands, that will be the medium. Uh, so if it just says cadmium red, it will be the medium. Cadmium red also comes in a deep and a light. That is not a change of value. That is actually a change of placement on the hue aspect of the wheel. So the deep moves a little closer to the purple side and the light, as I just uh, demonstrated, moves closer to the orange side, almost in a true red orange. Uh, I like the cadmium red medium or just cadmium red, and that's a spectrum red, very beautiful fire engine red that we've got up there. And this is authentic cadmium red medium. You can feel that weight. <laughs> the cadmiums are always a little heavier. Uh, it is a metal. Uh, and uh, you can always check on the back of the tube. Always tells you your ingredient list, pigment red 108. That is cadmium red. Um, if it says cadmium red hue, H-U-E, that's a different way of using hue than what we're talking about with our color wheel uh, here. Our hue is, uh, is different. Um, that hue simply means that there is none of the named pigment actually in the tube. So they will have used cheaper alternatives inside of there, usually a, a barium or a pyrrol red or something else that's, uh, that's less expensive. Same thing with cadmium orange. And there you go, cadmium orange, pigment orange 20, and that's what that little shorthand means. Now, cadmium orange, uh, just pure cadmium orange, not deep, is more of a yellow orange. It's an orange, yellow orange right there on the line, so we do not put it at a spectrum orange. Cadmium lemon is my preferred uh, cadmium yellow. Uh, I used to use cadmium yellow light, and that is basically in the same spot, but the cadmium lemon appears to be a little more opaque, which was the really the big knock I had on cadmium yellow light or pale, was that I would always have to put down a couple of layers. And you can see that beautiful color right there, rich and spectrum yellow. That's what you want from your yellow. Of course, cadmium yellow also comes in uh, a light, a medium, and, and a deep, and those are also not value changes, but hue changes, just cascading closer to the orange side of the spectrum. Uh, we're moving on to our greens now, so we're moving around the wheel. Thalo green and then thalo blue. We've covered them in large measure, uh, or more properly, th thalocyanine. So you can see that right there, chlorinated copper thalocyanine, PG7. And thalo blue, which is pigment blue 15. P, B. So the P always stands for pigment. Uh, B is blue. BK is, is black. BR is brown. Uh, and you'll, you'll start to figure that out as you go. My next blue is ultramarine blue. And this is the spectrum blue. Now, it's a slightly lower saturation than the thalos are. And that's why the, this blue comes in a little bit on the wheel. It's still in the intense you know, kind of kind of territory, but it's not quite as intense as you would find with those thalos. I think we know that, but it's a nice true blue, a nice spectrum blue. That's uh, a 29, uh, pigment blue 29. Uh, then I've got black and white, and black and white are in the middle here. Ivory black. Let's see where they got this listed on the right side over here. PBK9, you can see that. And titanium white and this is there you go pigment white four dioxazine purple up here not quite a spectrum purple just a little bit more to the warm side pigment violet number 23 and my newest addition to the palette quinacridone magenta so quinacridone magenta pigment red 122 again my tubes are well loved and, uh, and we can see these colors down here. I think that's uh, there. You can see it a little better on the, uh, on the video there. So those are the pigments that I use and you can see how they're arranged around the wheel. Nine of them are high saturation. Nine of them are way out at the outer uh, rim of the color wheel. And only two of them, black and white, are in the middle. Now the reason for that is because we know that if we mix these colors together, we can lower the saturation and bring them closer to the center and therefore cover in those areas. So if you wanted to really talk about a palette, what's a palette's opportunities available to you, um, what we would do here is we could kind of connect the dots. By connecting the dots out on the outer rim of here, just including these 11 pigments, we get a feel 
for how much of the observable mixable color universe we can actually mix. We can mix with these 11 pigments, well really with those nine, of course you need black and white to make things more realistic. You can mix all of this. So the only exceptions, what colors can you not mix on this color wheel from these 11 pigments? Super high saturation red oranges, super high saturation yellow greens, super high saturation blue purples, and that's about it. I mean, you have some negligible amounts, you know, kind of over, over in these sections, but everything in here can be mixed from these pigments. Understand why? Because if you're mixing, you know, let's say you wanna mix a color, you know, here, you can mix alizarin crimson, and then some of the green and yellow mixture together will, will get us there. Alternatively, you could use quinacridone magenta and a different proportion of the green and the yellow. And that would all get us here. Again, any color that you plot, sorry, I've hit my camera. Any color that you plot that's inside of these boundaries can be mixed with these pigments. Only a color that exists outside could not be mixed with these pigments. And so you would need to add another pigment or pigments to mix them. In my experience, 20 some years of painting, I have not needed any of those other colors. Um, yes, there are intense red orange things that can exist. You can mix colors of higher saturation, but I find that I don't encounter them very much in life. And as a painter who works observationally, who's capturing the world that I see, I find that I don't have much need for that. Every once in a while, <clears throat> a subject matter will come along that will require the addition of another pigment. And most recently, eh, recently being about five years ago, um, quinacridone magenta was that. Previously, we had only had dioxazine purple and alizarin crimson, and just the bridge from there to there uh, seemed sufficient for rendering uh, a range of pinks, red purples. But enough of my students kept coming into class wanting to paint beautiful pink flowers out in nature that we found that the mixture of alizarin crimson over to dioxazine purple was losing just a little bit too much saturation to capture what we saw in, in life and, and in, in photographs, wherever we were getting our imagery from. So we needed a higher saturation pigment to just span this very, very tiny distance from here to here, but that was enough to warrant the addition of another pigment on the palette. So that quinacridone really fit the bill. Um, let me show you some of these pigments and you know, kind of some of their qualities, and we'll just play around a little bit. I'm actually gonna squeeze out a good bit of white paint here so you can see, especially some of these darker tones, what we're working with. So why don't we start back down with that quinacridone? Hopefully you can see that low on the screen. Uh, I'm just gonna, maybe I'll grab that, put it up a little higher so you can see. There's that quinacridone magenta. Look at what beautiful luster, let me slide that over, beautiful intensity we've got to this pigment. That is a vibrant pink, and that is a single, single pigment that's producing that high saturation pink. You can't get that from mixing two colors together. Let me show you previously what two colors we were mixing together. Dioxazine purple, which as you can see here, nice true purple. and also alizarin crimson. And for alizarin, I go all the way back up to the top here and grab that one. This is that permanent, alizarin permanent. You can see that pigment that we're getting right there really comes alive. Now these two are both intense colors, but when we mix them together to try to achieve the pink that we might be seeing on a particular flower, you can tell already that that saturation is getting a little lower. I'm gonna add a little more white to get it to match the value of what we have down here, but that's just gonna continue to weaken the tinting strength of that pigment and, and knock the saturation down lower and lower. So again, we had a lot of pink flowers that were not being satisfied by that pigment 
mixture, the alizarin and the dioxazine. So the jump up to the quinacridone was necessary. And again, that's an illustration of really just the difference between being here and being here, just there to there is the difference in, in real world mixing of there to there. And I think you can see that is enough of a difference if you were making a pink flower, I think this would be very dissatisfying to you. So we would wanna have that higher saturation. Anytime you find a need, feel free to add additional, uh, additional pigments to the list. And again, just pull this out, mark it on the wheel and put it back in to, uh, to the bag. Uh, let's see, we've got some questions I see coming in. Uh, Barbara Kala wants to know, can we talk about the drying time for the colors? Absolutely, Barbara. All paints are made from different pigments. That's the PB and PG and PO uh, notes that we were just talking about, those numbers. Each of those is something different in the world. Some of them are metals, some of them are organic elements like, uh, like dirt and clay. Um, others are synthesized in laboratories and have no real world function other than that. We've created them for the purpose of being high saturation pigments. My point in saying that is that each of them is chemically different. And as much as we would love to think that they're all just shades of the same kind of stuff in the world, they're not. Uh, and as a result, each pigment has its own particular properties, color, of course, tinting strength we've talked about, but also drying time. The drying times really do vary from one pigment to the other. Some will dry incredibly quickly, usually within a few hours. Those tend to be our older pigments, our pigments that are made from things in the earth, you know, dirts and, you know, and clay and such like that. Burnt umber, burnt sienna, raw umber, raw sienna. Those colors, yellow ochre, they tend to dry quicker. Their molecules are a little, uh, a little, thicker and clumsier. They don't need as much oil mixed into them. And so as a result, uh, without as much oil, they dry a little, a little more quickly. Whereas our more modern pigments, the ones that have those chemical names, dioxazine purple, quinacridone magenta, thalocyanine blue and, um, and, and green. Those are modern pigments and they tend to require more oil be mixed into them. As a result, those tend to be our slower drying time pigments. And you might know that, you know, that the thalo blue and the thalo green, the alizarin uh, crimson, the quinacridone and dioxazine tend to dry a little slower, whereas your browns or your black and white tend to dry a bit quicker. Your medium era of, uh, of pigments are those metal name. This is, uh, you know, when we were just throwing everything we could into the blast furnace, which was just invented in, you know, dawn of the industrial revolution. Let's see what happens when we throw this metal in there, this cadmium metal. Oh, if I heat it up to X temperature, it turns red. Heat it up to Y temperature, it turns orange and so on and so on. So those tend to have a medium uh, drying time in, in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of hours. Uh, just kind of on their own. So again, your older pigments uh, are going to dry a little quicker. Your your um, burnt umber, burnt sienna, your ivory black, things that are made from like real solid stuff in the world, mostly unchanged, maybe just a little burning. Uh, your medium, uh, your, your industrial revolution pigments, the ones that have the chemical names like cadmium and cobalt and manganese, those will tend to dry medium. Uh, amount of time, and then your more modern pigments that have those chemical names, quinacridone, dioxazine, thalocyanine, those tends to tend to dry your slowest. So that's a pretty good, you know, kind of rubric to follow. It's not 100%, you know, kind of accurate. There are variations, but hopefully that, uh, that helps to satisfy uh, a general idea. Uh, and um, happy to see if there's a follow-up question there. Uh, Nan asks, is there a way to tell what the saturation level is by reading the label or do you have to get it and test it to see? Uh, Nan, that is not listed on the label. The most that you'll get on the label is, uh, you know, if it's transparent, opaque, or semi-transparent. Uh, every one of them should be light fast. Series three, that, those series numbers are just, uh, that's just sales. That's just uh, how expensive it's going to be for you uh, to, to do. And they all conform to STT. Um, you know, they're all safe enough. Uh, and if they're not, then they'll have a, a note on the back. Uh, some of the cadmiums carry that, you know, as you get a warning. 
uh, onto here that this is carcinogenic and we don't have a lot of lead paints uh, these days. But unfortunately, yeah, we don't have a sense of the saturation on the back. The closest you might get would be the um, uh, kind, of, kind of oil absorption and spectral analyses that are um, visible in a Ralph Mayer's Artist Handbook. If you have that, uh, that book, uh, you can look up, but that gets a little, you know, a little more science-y than, than I think most of us are interested in. Uh, so, you know, I think we'll just kind of play around and test things out, but it's always fun to go to the art store and try a new pigment. I, I've got about a half, you know, I got about a dozen pigments I'm gonna be playing around with uh, over the next couple of weeks, just kind of testing some things out. I always think it's kind of fun to just play around with some new ones. So I mentioned Cadmium Orange Deep, Got a couple of cadmium yellows I'd like to play around with. I got the chromium, uh, you know, ultramarine violet, which used to be on my palette. I'm gonna get back into playing around with that cobalt blue. There's nothing wrong with any pigment. They just simply exist in different places on the wheel. So if your main goal is to create a, a set of pigments that you're working with that provides you the opportunity not to be limited in any way, then starting with some high saturation pigments around the perimeter of the wheel is the best way to accomplish that. And you can always supplement, you can always remove, play around with those, uh, you know, but, uh, but that's up to you uh, and, and your experience. And what artists tend to find are colors that they repeat a lot. If you're a painter who works primarily, and I'll tie this into Betsy's question, uh, another green, if you're a painter who's out in the landscape constantly and you're working with a lot of, uh, of greens and you consistently find that you're working in a very low saturation uh, of greens, it may not be to your long-term benefit to have phthalo green as your sole candidate for green out here and always have to mix it with yellow and always have to add a bunch of reds into it. You might want to populate your palette with some additional greens. So what are, what are some greens? Well, let me grab, you know, this is the full, full list of gambling pigments. They, they have this, uh, these wonderful flyers that you can get from them. If you pick up any of their materials, let me, fold this out and you can see that they have a number of different greens so we've got everything from viridian which true viridian is different than phthalo green a lot of brands will just call it viridian but it's got uh, it's just phthalo green and white sometimes so you want to check the back of the tube make sure you have true viridian uh, you've got cobalt green which is quite expensive but uh, but you know very beautiful in its way uh, a chromium oxide green. This is probably a good candidate if you're out in the landscape uh, a lot. Uh, emerald green. Now, we're starting to get to some mixed colors. So cadmium green isn't actually a pigment. There isn't uh, a temperature that you can warm cadmium green up to or cadmium metal up to and it turns green. Cadmium green is, is a mixture of phthalo green and, and cadmium yellow. So uh, just kind of know that as you, uh, as you go through, um, which, which gives us some wonderful consolation. You remember I connected the line between phthalo green and, and yellow and said we can't mix a high saturation yellow green? Well, good news, there ain't one. There isn't one that appears in a palette or in nature, uh, so we don't have to have that color. Uh, that one's actually, you know, a kind of a, a bit of a misnomer. It exists on the wheel just to keep it being a wheel, but you don't really need it. Um, way down here in, in the kind of classical colors, and these are some of those dirt colors, are terra verte, which literally translates to green earth, and, uh, and olive green, and olive green can be a mixture as well sometimes. Terra verte can be a mixture uh, sometimes as well. But um, uh, true terra verte is an incredibly weak, low tinting strength, low saturation, yellow, uh, green, yellow, green. And you've got a few more over here as well you can play around with. So yeah, you can, you can definitely add other greens to your palette to find out if, uh, if you're working with, you know, uh, you know, if you're working in a range that consistently is here, maybe there isn't as much benefit to starting with, you know, the phthalo green and the yellow. I personally love this palette and I just was wrapping up a painting, uh, you know, of, uh, it was two brown dogs and, you know, I needed about 20 different uh, mixtures of brown. Most of them were in this territory, but I didn't use any brown paint. I mixed all of it out of cad red and cad orange and, and blue and green primarily to lower that saturation. As a result, I stayed completely in charge of the temperature and the saturation 
and the, with the addition of black and white, the value of all of those pigments, it was much more cohesive as a final painting because I was pulling on the same strings of red and orange, red and orange, blue, blue green versus the red orange mixed, and then black and white, staying in control. So that's something that I really enjoy in my palette is just kind of sticking with that high saturation uh, set of pigments. So. Uh, good. Any other questions we have? Let me see. Uh, checking back through the list. Let's see. Very good. No other questions. Uh, another green and great info on the greens. Wonderful, Margo. Uh, great to hear that. And, um, you know, uh, uh, there are no bad colors, you know, just I would always recommend that you read your ingredient list. Always check the back of the tube, I almost always recommend that you're using one pigment tubes of paint. Uh, and I, I would, would be very cautious about making sure that you read the back of the label. Don't just trust what it says on the front. If the word hue is listed on the front, know that that means there's none of the named pigment in there. You always want to make sure that you're testing, uh, you know, checking what your ingredient list are. You would do that with your food, do it with your paints, and you're going to have a really good experience, uh, I think. Oh, and Nan has one last question, and this will probably be it for, our, for today. Last week, we talked about browns and how it was better to mix the brown than buy it. I can mix yellow ochre with my colors, but it is a pain. Is the tube yellow ochre less brilliant than if I mixed it? Yes, Nan, as we went over last week, the mixed colors do end up being less vibrant than the mixed colors that you would make. However, um, there is something to be said for the fact that you are just using one pigment as opposed to two, three, or even four pigments to arrive at that, at that uh, territory. So if you have burnt sienna, which lives here, and you are mixing together cad red, cad orange, thalo blue, and thalo green, to arrive at that color, you already have four pigments mixed into there as opposed to just the one burnt sienna. So that is a suggestion that I would make. If you're finding that you're consistently losing saturation because you have so many colors mixed in, to create those browns, you might actually prefer to go back to the burnt sienna or the burnt umber uh, for the pictures you're making. My, my statement remains what it was last time. I'm someone who has, enjoys using the color to unlock harmonizations within my painting, connections between the reds and oranges that I've used. And so for that reason, I, I find it very beneficial to use those 11 pigments and not introduce any new uh, ones that are basically redundant. Uh, and and on, I'll be honest, most paintings, I don't even use all 11. Most paintings you find only need maybe three or four pigments because your, your painting exists in some narrow range. Uh, and we can even speak to that in, for just a moment here, a little bonus time, uh, that if you're making a painting and you kind of plot the colors, you have some medium to low saturation greens, uh, you've got some orange browns in your scene, you have a blue sky, let's say, kind of up in that saturation, you can kind of plot where the colors of your painting are. And then if you can draw a triangle or a rectangle around that, then you can mix that color. So these medium to low saturation greens, sure we'd need Thalo green, but you can run straight to cadmium orange and we can still mix all of these. None of them are outside of that line and would require the cadmium yellow. Sure, we need the ultramarine blue to mix that bright sky, but if I run over to the cadmium red and then down to the cadmium orange, I find that all of my dots are held within that rectangle or, you know, whatever shape that is. Um, so I can make this entire painting that has blues, greens, red, oranges, all that stuff, out of cad red, cad um, orange, phthalo green, and ultramarine blue, plus black and white, of course. They always get included uh, as our only value mod modifier. But that's it, four pigments. So I won't need dioxazine, quinacridone, alizarin. I won't even need phthalo blue or cadmium yellow that day. This really allows us to um, make painting not only faster and easier and maybe a little less expensive. You don't have to squeeze out all of your tubes of paint, but more harmonious. And that's the big thing. So if you said, 
then Nan, if you said, well, I, I've got a lot of browns here, so let me also add burnt sienna. No, I've got some yellow ochre-ish colors over here. Let me add some yellow ochre. You're adding more pigments where there's no value for it. So having a full strategy of how to work with your color wheel, your painter's compass color wheel. And again, no other color wheel does this. I had someone say, I haven't worked with a color wheel before. No other color wheel does this. This is absolutely unique to the painter's compass color wheel and the system that we've devised for how to work with this. Built on Albert Munsell's color theory of hue, saturation, and value, we called it chroma, um, but made so simplistic with the mechanisms that we've got here with the wet erase marker, the lamination inside of the bag. Guys, I encourage you, if you don't have one yet, grab one, start practicing it. Not only understand how your palette works, but understand how you can shortcut through your painting process, make yourself a lean, mean color mixing and painting machine. So I wanna thank you all for uh, joining me today for another paint um, mixing Monday. And you know, we, we got introduced to the, the palette that I recommend, these 11 colors that I've used for many years now, and I encourage these 11 colors. All my students are gonna be very familiar with these colors, but any palette can work for you so long as you understand where those colors plot on the color wheel and how the color wheel mixing can work. Thanks again for joining me. Again, this is Glenn Kessler over at the Compass Atelier outside of Washington, D.C., signing off from another Mixing Monday. Hope to catch you next week, and uh, I'll let you know in a couple of days what we're going to be talking about then. Oh, as always, feel free to make some comments, questions, and ask for uh, what you'd like to see in our next video. And please do share these videos with others in your community, and grab another color wheel if, uh, if you're running low or have a friend who might enjoy one. Take care. Thanks again. See you next week.